listening. Hey, Matthew, how's it going? How you doing, Sean? Yeah, doing fantastic. Just let me tell the viewers, British actor Matthew left the UK many years ago to conquer the US, residing in Texas. He saw firsthand how the industry has changed, how Hollywood has gone woke, and if there is any hope. And we are, just, just before we get into this, we are a heavily censored channel. They are watching us, so we can't talk about the pandemic, the vaccines, yeah, um, yeah, that that kind of stuff. I've got to stay away from that. But yeah, if, could you just give, give the viewers a little bit of your backstory before we get into the hot issues, please? Oh, you mean I, I'm an actor, so you want me to talk about myself? I think it's going to take longer than half an hour. I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I just, you know, I grew up uh, on a council estate back in the UK, uh, wanted to be an actor my whole life, you know, I mean, it wasn't really something that you you ever think is going to happen. Uh, I thought I was going to be doing theatre and all that, uh, managed to get a break, did Coronation Street over there, and that was very good for me, and then I had a fleeting music career and and then I did a movie with Michael Caine that then got me to come over to America. And my first movie over here was was this one beyond was Black Hawk Down. Um and then I went on from there, did a bunch of um did a bunch of big movies. And and that's basically it, you know, very uh, lucky guy, you know, was in the right place at the right time a bunch of times and um you know, I had a little bit of talent to kind of get me there. And and then I, I just had enough of California about three years ago and, and left and moved to Texas. It was just like, it was just, I just couldn't deal with it. <laughs> I just couldn't deal with it. Too, too crazy. So that that's about it, really. That's my, that's my story, pretty much. Which does generate some follow-up questions. Wow, from a council <laughs> estate to Black Hawk Down. That's phenomenal. Congratulations, man. Thank you. We're about... Whereabouts in the UK were you? So I have to be careful with this because if ever I say like, certainly for Americans, if I say I'm from the Midlands, like right in the middle near Birmingham, everyone from the black country, which is where I'm really from, are like, oh, you didn't say you're from the black country. <laughs> so I'm from this this place called the Utre Estate, uh, which is, it's kind of weird because it borders West Bromwich and Warsaw for those of you that know that area. So I'm from there, basically. That's that's where I grew up. Uh, my mom was a single parent, and um, and yeah, I mean, I just I just had a dream of becoming an actor. I think it was, uh, you know, I loved the Rocky movies, which was uh, they were really inspiring for me. Which was kind of strange years later to be saving Rambo's life, um, you know. So it's it, all a, all a bit trippy, mate. All a bit trippy. You're kind of like, what? Oh, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, yeah. I mean, um, ended up over here. Love it in America. I know you've spent, you know, a few years over here yourself. Um, but I, I really love it. It's, um, you know, I really got a sense of what freedom really is over here, and and Texas is the home of that. So I eventually moved here like three years ago. You give me flashbacks, Matthew, because I grew up on Coronation Street. I was born in '68, right? And I still, I still can't get that theme tune out of my head. That yeah, <laughs> wah, 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 wah. yeah. I, see, I never used to watch it actually. Believe it or not, I was an EastEnders fan. I always used to watch EastEnders, and and when I got into Corrie, it was kind of it was very very weird, but um, but it was a, an amazing thing. And you know what's funny. Uh, especially with the UK press, when I left Coronation Street, because I always saw myself as just a, as just an actor that was, I was a job in actor. You know, I did one thing, then I wanted to move something else to something else, and and doing Coronation Street was was so massive, especially at that period of time when I was in ninety seven to ninety eight. Like, so I, I was actually at my first episode on March the third, uh, nineteen ninety seven, which was my birthday. And the next day, everything changed. And th there used to be 19 million people watch that show when I was in it. And, and it was instant fame. Uh, it, it, very, very strange experience. You're not really kind of built to cope with that. You know, it's like getting a lot of money young, getting a lot of fame young. It kind of messes with you a little bit. Uh, and so it was, it, was, it was weird. And then moving to L.A. and being in all these movies with all these people that you grow up watching, Again, another kind of surreal experience, but but different in the sense that people kind of left you alone over in the U.S. So it was I couldn't go to Sainsbury's away when I was on Coronation Street. It was a, it was just a nightmare, 
Um, uh, and then, and then he, you know, oddly enough, did bigger movies over here and became kind of less famous, if that makes any sense. But uh, yeah, it was kind of, kind of strange, strange experience. So, but so I was in America from ninety one to two thousand seven, so I missed those Curry episodes. So were you a goodie or were you a villain? What was your role? I was a goodie. I think I was a goodie. Uh, I think I was, I was mainly known for having an affair with Sally Webster. Uh, but, but I was the good guy cause her husband, Kevin was having an affair anyway. And so I came in and I was, I was the good guy, but, but again, I, I just, I wanted to be in it for one year. I didn't want to be in it any longer. And when I left, it's funny cause it, you know, the, the press was like, Oh, he thinks he's too big for current. I, that, that wasn't it at all. I just wanted to move on. You know, I, I, I didn't want to be in that show, although I loved it. Uh, everyone was great on it and the fans are amazing. I wanted to challenge myself and do other things, which I've done. So, so you, so you wasn't a dirty den type. Character. I wasn't a dirty den. No, I wasn't a dirty <laughs> den. No, I was, I was a good dude. So, what what year did you go to the states? So, I came over here first in two thousand, uh, and that's where I got Black Hawk Down. And so, it was my first film in America, which was like I was kind of like, well, I should have done this ages ago. You <laughs> know, being in a two, double Oscar winning Ridley Scott movie, uh, was and that, that was. was that your- was that your first movie then? It was my first movie over here. Yeah, I did a movie oh with Michael Caine. Yeah, I know, I know. Oh. It was, it was, it was just crazy, and and you know, it was kind of like the British invasion. Then, if you look at that movie, there's a bunch of us in there uh, that are Brits, and and we just blew the doors open on blow the doors open on Hollywood after I did a movie <laughs> with uh, with Michael Caine. So yeah, so. My ego was as big as the Grand Canyon when I was running around in Arizona as a Brit, you know. They roll, roll out the red carpet, hear your accent, throwing parties. How did you keep your ego in check? Um, I, you know what? I I've just, I think my my mom, as I was growing up, she was always like, be humble, be humble, be humble. And that, that was kind of like kind of like in me from a very young age. So I know that some people will think you're an egomaniac. It's funny because, like, you know, just getting into the podcasting, I, I didn't really want to do it because I'm like, who wants to listen to me? You know, I mean, I'm just a meat puppet, you know, that's out there doing other people's words. But um, I, I think it's, you know, I, I never really saw myself anything other than a working class counts- kid from a council estate that was just very lucky to do what I do. You know, I, I know that it can go at any minute. And I know that, that there are other people that could replace me that are as good, if not better than me. So I, I just felt I was always very, very grateful of every single thing that I had. So, I, and I think we, you know, you and I are kind of different tra- trajectories. I mean, you know, you, you were a phenomenon, you know, a phenom from when you were 16, right? So, uh, and again, when you, when you start making money like that and you, you get into that world, it's, it is easy to get sucked in. Right, it's really easy to get sucked in, and I don't think people truly understand when these things open for you how easy it is to step through that door. Right, it's just you know it's there, and you might feel invincible, but for me, I always felt like I I, I don't know I, there was a I don't know whether it's that Irish Catholic guilt that stopped me a lot of the time, but um, uh, no, I always felt like I was very lucky, and I still do. I feel like I'm very lucky to have done what I've done, and. And I'm I'm very appreciative of it. So I, I don't know what it was that that stopped me from going off the rails, but it, I don't know. I, I I guess I did somehow. Were you single when you arrived in America? Were you getting invited to parties? Yes. Uh, did you have any? <laughs> what what? Which one? <laughs> no, I mean, I, yes, I was single, and yes, I was invited to a lot of parties. But you know, I was getting to that point because when I was in Coronation Street. Uh, it was it was so insane. Like you actually end up feeling very lonely, and I I actually felt very very alone uh, because you realize that I mean I don't know if it was like it for you. You know, initially you're like, oh everybody likes me. You know, I'm a I'm a great guy, and then you realize actually no, they want something from you. Like everyone wants something from you, and when you can't give them that anymore, or, or you know, if you don't please them in the way that they want, then they turn on you. So I you know I ended up feeling very lonely and when i went over to the states you know of course i mean i'd go to like you know go to the maxim party i I was invited to the vanity fair party for the oscars so the first oscars i ever went to we won two oscars for this thing here behind and uh and that was kind of trippy you know i was there and you look around and all these people there that you've watched on television and then all of a sudden you realize well hang on a minute i'm in the mix now like i'm one of them 
if you know what I mean. I mean, I might not have been at that level of, you know, Guy Ritchie or whatever, but you, you were going to all those same parties. And I, I did, I remember that the night before the Oscars, I got invited to my agent's house. And I remember like, it was so weird, you know, it was, it was so trippy. And I went and I had a, I had a drink. I got introduced to Nicole Kidman and, and my agent came up and she went, he goes, she's not got a date for tomorrow night. And I'm like, you gotta be <laughs> kidding. And then, and then, you know, I showed, honestly, I, I remember like, they have these things called, I don't know if they have them in the UK now, you know, those love sacks. They're like these giant big, um, like, uh, cushiony things that you can sit back on. And I was like so drunk cause I was so like, this is so weird. And I remember like dropping back and then this girl like comes and sits next to me and she starts talking to me and, and we have a great conversation. And, you know, she's saying like, Oh, this is, you know, the, these things never get like kind of normal and blah, blah, blah. And then I realized it's Renee Zellweger. Right, like, and she's hammered as well, like right next to me, and we're we're in the library of this this beautiful Hollywood house, just chatting about that stuff. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of that was kind of was was weird, uh, and yeah, I did get invited to a lot of parties, um, but uh, and then and then shortly after, I, I met my wife. So then I was kind of tamed. The yeah, the the tiger was tamed quite shortly after my uh, my my first couple of years in Hollywood. So there's a lot of conspiracy theories pertaining to what happens at these parties in Hollywood. <laughs> Did you I didn't eat any babies. I didn't. I, the <laughs> babies were not on the menu. No, you know, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, honestly, Sean, I have, I never saw any of that. I mean, I certainly, um, the deals are made there, right? Like I remember, so I'd, I'd gone up for a show that will remain nameless uh, and I'd, I'd, I'd gone and met the producers and the director and everything. And the, the director was the showrunner. You know, the showrunner is the person that basically makes all the decisions. And I'd met them the like literally the day before. And I'm at this party and one of the producers there and he's like, Hey Matt. And I'm like, Hey, and he goes, uh, uh, so, uh, I hate to tell you, man, you're not getting the role. And I was like, shit. <laughs> like, and he goes, but nobody is because the show is just been canceled. Right. So I think that, you know, when you are in that, in those environments, you get to mix with all the people at the top levels. So, you know, if you're a big movie actor and there's a director there, you're going to meet them. And he's like, Hey, do you want to do this film? And the, the actor might go, Oh, what's it about? Blah, blah, blah. Yes, I'll do it. So there's a lot of those deals done in the, at, the, at those parties uh, that, that kind of, it kind of greases the wheels. It gets past the agents, you know, so the agents aren't actually blocking them. So the, the directors and the, the actors will talk to one another or an actor will say, Hey, do you want to come and do this? And, and so there's a lot of that, but I never saw any of the, the dodgy stuff. Ne like never, I didn't see any dodgy stuff at all at any of those parties. Were you, were you invited to become a Freemason anything like that? No, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. I mean, I've been, I, you know, there's, there's a couple of people that, you know, that, that they'll sniff around you. Like, they want to know certain things about you. I mean, certainly they want to, uh, th there's certainly been times when people have been testing out like whether I'm gay or not. I mean, that, that, that definitely w was one of the things, uh, or whether or not I did, you know, I'd be open to, you know, going and dating certain people, as I told you. Um, but you know, nothing, I mean, people would do that when you're in a bar, uh, you know, so, or down the pub. So nothing really, I mean, but, but I'm very much a, a kind of straightforward kind of person, you know, so I don't know if I give off, give off the wrong kind of vibes, you, you know what I mean? Uh, but I certainly know that, uh, through talking to other people that there's shady stuff going on without a doubt. Like I've, I've spoken to people that have experienced it as well. Um, within the confines of YouTube's community guidelines, are you able to expand on that or describe any of that? Uh, I just know, you know, when the Me Too movement came out, um, when that came out, I'd already, I'd spoken to a guy uh, that was married to a famous actress and said that she was put into a really, really bad situation. Uh, I know that's very nebulous, but um, but it, yeah, I mean, she was put into, I, I don't want to betray that person's trust, uh, but they were put into a very, very difficult situation. And they, they'd made it, made it quite clear to other people that it had happened and nobody cared. Uh, no, like that, that didn't care. Nobody cared at all. And there's certainly, uh, I spoke to this young girl on, on, uh, Twitter, 
uh, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've seen her. She, she, um, X or whatever it is. I'm, I'm like the last guy. I, I just can't. I, it's just something about calling it X. I can't do it. It's weird. But uh, I know that she uh, had certainly been preyed upon. And um, I mean, when, uh, and I've said this before, when I did my movie, I Am That Man, I wrote, directed, produced, and starred in it. And the only reason why I put my son in it was because he had a, he, he's got a photographic memory. So we could just learn all the lines. And I knew that he would turn up on time and I wouldn't have to deal with awkward parents. So I put him in the film. And the moment he was in, like the agents, you know, were flocking around him and they were like, we want your son, we want your son. And I was like, no chance. There's no way I'm going to let my son go into Hollywood. Not a chance. And I was, you know, I mean, there's, it, it's quite clear, you know, that there are, I think it's like anything, it's like the Boy Scouts. Uh, and you've seen these opportunities for, you know, uh, predators to go into these roles because that's their focus. And I, I think that um, that uh, Hollywood is no different. You know, it's all about power, right? So I didn't want my kids anywhere near that. And uh, and again, one of the reasons why I've moved out of Hollywood is is, is it's, it's, it's got so weird. It's so weird out there. Like, it's not what it was like when I first went there. It's just completely changed. Or I, I don't know if it's... Or, or I don't know if it's become more um, obvious, you know, like because people become emboldened, right, in their dysfunction. So I think it's become a little bit more obvious the way that the way that people act and behave. So I was like, I'm out. It's not for yeah, me. Yeah, we had we had Corey Feldman on, and he told us some horror oh. stories about his childhood. Yeah, heartbreaking stuff. All right, so you're out there, massive movie deals. You're going to parties. You get married. That puts the brakes on somewhat. What were the first things like that kind of like made you start to turn against uh, living in California? Well, I think that what I started seeing was people saying that they were really tolerant and they're not tolerant at all. There was no um, kind of acceptance of other people's point of views or, or even engaging with them. You know, it was just like, this is the way you are. If you think this, then you think, xyz as well right and we all know that people are nuanced right there's no people started like cramming people into into groups which i don't like i think it's very dangerous to do that i mean history's shown us it's very dangerous to do that and i didn't like it and then there were certain things that were going on like the lawlessness in california that was just completely illogical uh, uh treating different people unequally but saying that it was because of equality. And I'm like, I don't like that. That that's not that's not the way I grew up. Because you know, I mean, you know, if you grow up in the UK and you're poor, it doesn't matter if you're poor and black or if you're poor and white or if you're poor and Asian, it doesn't matter. You're poor. It's a class system, right? So what I started seeing over there was this kind of like balkanization of different people and it being manipulated. And I didn't like that. Uh, and so I'm like, you know what, I don't want to be a part of this because I mean. We can go in to Starbucks and order a, you know, triple shot soy latte, whatever you want to make it. And and nobody blinks an eye at the nuances in ordering, however wacky they are, in ordering a coffee. But if you say, well, you know what, I am for low taxes or, you know, whatever it be politically, and then all of a sudden you're an evil person on the right uh, uh, in the same way. Uh, you know, like not to get too political, but Joe Biden saying, you know, if you don't vote for me, you ain't black. I'm like, well, hang on a minute. Like, wh what? What are you saying? And I, I don't know if it's because I'm a Brit over here. I don't know if you experience the same. Like, I, I couldn't even tell you any of my family voted for. It, it wasn't a, a real big deal, but I started seeing them pushing, pushing, and then pushing agendas into films. And I'm like, I just want to, I just want to watch a good film. I don't give a damn about x y or z right and they started pushing that more and more and more and more and i'm just like that's not what i got into the industry for you know what i mean it never was and so yeah who, who was pushing agendas into films and what were the agendas well i think it's a combination i think it's a combination of the woke uh studios feeling like that is that is what people want because they live in a bubble. Like Hollywood's a very, very small bubble. So if you go out to a, I'll give an example of this, right? So I got a call from my agent and he goes, and he's laughing like this, it's no joke. He goes, they're doing a new Rambo movie. 
and they want to know if you're interested. And I'm like, what? They're doing a new freaking Rambo movie? Or what? And they want to, they, they're wondering if I'm interested in being in it. Are you out of your mind? Yeah. And he couldn't believe that I wanted to do this archaic action film with this action. And I'm like, what are you talking? Of course I want to do it. And so there's a there's a big disconnect with what people actually want to watch and what they're making, you know, out there. Uh, and I think part of it is because, and I've said this before, I think people think that, all right, the difference between me and another one of the, you know, the majority of actors that are that are absolutely giant household names is is maybe fractional. And the difference between me and people working in Starbucks who haven't had a break is fractional, right? It's just very small. It, you, you have to be able to get in there and you have to deliver at that moment and everything has to go right for you. And so, uh, you know, once you get to a certain level, you just keep making the money, you keep getting the jobs. But the truth is, is there's a, there's a razor thin line between whether or not you're making a hundred million dollars a year or you're making, you know, $35,000 a year at Starbucks, right? And so with that comes a lot of guilt, right? If you are the guy that gets chosen, because, you know, oftentimes you'll have multiple people. Let's say when you're doing a TV show, you're down to the last three people for the role. And that could be playing Matthew Perry's, which is which happened to a friend of mine. It was between him, Matthew Perry, and another guy for Friends, right? And Matthew Perry got it. And I mean, unfortunately he died, right? And because there's a lot of other stuff that comes with that. And it's not all what everyone makes it out to be. But he made hundreds of millions of dollars. And my buddy didn't, right? And they know that. They know that, really. So with someone like me who I had to pay my own way through college and I, you know, I worked as a butcher and I worked on a shoe shop and I, you know, all that, like I I, I worked my ass off to get where I am, right? But there's a lot of other people that haven't and they they were in a, maybe they were compromised, maybe, maybe not, maybe they're just in the right place at the right time. But what that does, it gives them guilt. So when they have that guilt, they kind of say, well, I've got to give the disenfranchised a hand up, right? And I've, uh, you know, so I feel guilty about it. I don't feel guilty at all about anything. And I think that if you work hard enough, you get it. It's the look of the draw. That's it. I don't think anyone is any less of a of a talent than I am, or, you know, certainly not because of the color of their skin or the sexuality. I don't care about that. So, but a lot of people do. So what they do is they start cramming their politics into it and they start elevating people that maybe shouldn't be elevated. So you don't have that standard of quality that you used to have. Uh, and then, you know, once people get into that position, they know they're imposters. So they start hiring other people that are imposters and then you get the marvels right? It just turns to shit. That's the problem. So you, you have a bunch of woke people making woke content for themselves and not for anybody else. So, um, you know, that's why, and it's been reflected in the box office. That's why the box office is a terrible right now. Nobody wants to go and see it. So my background is in economics and the basis of economics is there's demand and supply. Mm -hmm. So if they're just supplying something that the public doesn't demand, Surely they would go broke. Well, they are. They're getting that way. Uh, it, it takes some time, right? Because you got to remember, if you've got somebody like Disney, right? Disney's got a back catalog of, I don't know, I mean, when was Steamboat Willie? I mean, 1950s, maybe, maybe before that. I'm, I'm not entirely sure, actually, when Snow White, which was the first animated film, came out. But they've got a, they've got a, a, a catalog of movies that people keep buying. Uh, I mean, we grew up, even in England, right? You grew up with, you know, Disney is the gold standard, right, of animation. Like, that's it. So they have all these movies. And if you want to put your kids in front of a film and you want to show them the classics, you know, it's Pinocchio, it's, it's Snow White, wh whatever it might be. So they have this big lump of, of um, a back catalog. So that's one thing. Secondly, Sean, as you know, as your background is in those things, is the one way you... You, you can either come up with new innovative things to move forward, which which Disney had, or you purchase, right? You purchase companies to expand and grow, right? So they purchased um, the Marvel, uh, Marvel. They purchased um, 
the Lucasfilm, right? So they were growing, but it took them a little bit of time before they got their fingers in that pie and made that content, right? And so now they're making the content and Dial of Destiny did nothing. Uh, uh, I can't remember what the Marvels did. It bombed uh, uh, the Wish, which was their um, anniversary thing they just did. I think it made $24 million over the weekend, which was just an absolute disaster. So they are going that way. Uh, and people certainly aren't going to the cinema anymore to watch them because they're like, I don't, I don't want my kids indoctrinated. Uh, this stuff is not good. And so they are going that way. But you got to remember the people in the positions of power, like I don't know how much Bob Iger's worth. He's worth $350 million. Like it's not going to ever personally affect him, right? Uh, he, he loses his job. So what? He can go and buy an island and go live on it right? And same with the directors, they get paid so much money, they don't care. So um, when it goes in the can, who's left holding the um, holding the, 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 the can for it, sorry, as it were, are the shareholders. And until the shareholders engage and say, listen, enough is enough, nothing's going to happen. But I think they will go broke, actually. I think that Disney has a good chance of, of going bankrupt. That's fascinating. So you're saying they've... Um use the vast resources of their back catalog to finance to continue to finance this woke garbage in the light of the not being demand for it. But that ties into the next question, which is from Ian. Will a localized counter Hollywood movie industry emerge as a consequence of this? Yeah, it will. Uh, but the problem is, is the people that are, um, are trying to build that, right? Like the people like me, like I'm, I'm, I've gone out multiple times to say about how you need to have a, um, let me just break it down a little bit. If you want to go and break into the system, what you have to do is you have to have a portfolio. It's a portfolio approach, right? So you have, let's say, 10 movies. Say we get an investment to $10 million. You make 10 $1 million movies. And, and if you do that, then the chances are you're going to get one of those that's going to hit. And this is what Bloomhouse does, right? So they'll go out and they'll make a bunch of movies that you don't hear, and then you'll get one paranormal activity, and it makes $150 million, and it funds it. So the other approach to that is that allows you to get into the marketplace. So it allows you to have leverage when you're talking to the cinemas. Because let's say me and you, Sean, we're going to make a movie. We're going to make a movie about your life story. And we go up and we go, hey, uh, Regal Cinemas, I've got this movie. And they go, okay, you've got one film. I don't care. Paramount's going to send me three this year or four. And one of them's Transformers. And we don't care about your movie. Right. So you have to have leverage when you're going out and you're breaking into that market. Right. So there needs to be people kind of people kind of go out and they'll say, well, I'll do one movie like I'll do like Sound of Freedom and, and something like that. And by the way, that was shelved for like five years until it was brought out. And then it was only a controversy, really, with them saying it was a right wing movie, which was about trafficking, like uh, that made, made it controversial and generated uh, PR. So it became a success. But what you really need to do is build a studio. And when I say studio, it needs to have more than one movie. So you have, you have leverage. And the majority of investors don't want to do that. They won't put money down like that. And, and also, uh, it is, um, it's, it's a very subjective industry, right? So uh, it's not like oil and gas or whatever, where you can say, okay, this is how much the commodity is. This is how much I can sell it. This is my, my margin or whatever it might be. It's, it's hit or miss. And the problem is, is a lot of people just go out and they'll say, well, you know, my dog Skip, it made $150 million. And you're like, yeah, but that's not the norm, right? It's not the norm. So there's multiple barriers for entry. Um, mainly it's because people don't know what they're doing. And secondly, it's because there's a bunch of grifters out there that say they know what they're doing, they don't, and the movies fail. But there is an opportunity. It's a massive opportunity. Massive. We've almost, we've almost run out of time. Two minutes to answer this question then from Jake. Who are the gatekeepers of the movie industry? Well, there's multiple. It's a great question. Agents, because if I had a script and I wanted to get it to Chris Pratt, and uh, I, I would have to send it to the agent, and if the agent doesn't want me to get it to Chris Pratt, they'll block it. Uh, and that means, so if you have Chris Pratt attached, he brings a monetary amount that you can go and sell the movie on. So that helps you bring revenue into the movie. So you've got, uh, agents that block it because either they don't know you, 
right? So I might be some some charlatan and they're rightly doing their job, they're blocking it, or they might not want him to do that material, or they might want him to have uh, another movie that he's getting paid more for. That's just normal. So you've got agents, you have distributors, a big problem. If you're doing a movie that they disagree with, they will block it. Or if they have someone, not that they'll block it, they just won't pick it up, right? Um, and so that's a big issue because if you have an actor that is is really worth something and you can't get to him, then you've got no way to distribute. You've got no way to get um, the movie into that person's hands. So um, agents, uh, distributors, and uh, and producers as well, like they will not take the stuff on that they um, they don't like. So there's barriers to that. And, and when I say like, it doesn't even mean, because it used to be they, they might like, I'm, I'm, I don't really like this the, the subject of this film, but I know it's marketable, so I'm going to put it out. They would rather put something out there now that is woke uh, because they go to all the parties and everyone pats them on the back about how great they are. Matthew, so, you're, great, you're a great speaker. Thanks for spending time with us. We'd love to get you back on. Can you please tell the viewers where they can find you and support you? Yeah, please go and look at me on look at me go on uh, on YouTube. I just started a, a, a channel there. It says Matthew D. Marsden, and I'm going to be tackling a whole bunch of things. And, and on X, I'm Matthew D. Marsden as well. So uh, thank you for having me on. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, me too. And enjoy Texas. Cheers, my friend. Take All care. right, mate. Bye. Bye-bye.